So it's four o'clock now. Um, so I think we should get started. Some people might be joining us uh, a little bit later, but um, I would like to welcome you all to today's Cher Bon de France lecture on the subject of the fiscal multiplier or the ability of fiscal policy to stimulate aggregate output. It's of course a classical subject in macroeconomics and perhaps also a somewhat political one. But I think it's fair to say that it has received increased attention in recent times. And that's of course because nominal interest rates have fallen to levels close to zero. And that has raised some doubts about whether monetary policy continues to be able to stabilize aggregate output. In this situation, unsurprisingly, there's been an increased demand on us researchers, uh, not least from policymakers, to quantify the ability of fiscal policy to stimulate output. In other words, to estimate the fiscal multiplier. But importantly, empirical, purely empirical estimates of the fiscal multiplier are not necessarily a good guide to current policy options, just because they are by definition contingent on history, both historical policies and historical contexts. This is why what we need, at least also, are structural models that allow us to quantify the effect of fiscal policy options on output. And in particular, we need structural models that are rich enough to incorporate the elements that theory tells us are important for the effects of fiscal policy. And I'm thinking of things such as output that is demand determined in the short run, of non-Ricardian consumptions, where there are potentially heterogeneous margins used to consume, and also uh, capital investment that may be clouded out by the issuance of debt. And in today's lecture, Kurt Midman, who you see on the bottom left-hand side of, uh, of your screen, I hope, will provide us exactly such a framework. Kurt, you are joining us from Milan today? Yes, from Milan. But your affiliation is with Stockholm University, where you're an associate professor. You are also a managing editor at the Review of Economic Studies, and you've published extensively on macroeconomic topics such as consumer default, housing, and unemployment, and importantly also on the macroeconomics of inequality, which uh, will turn out to be an important uh, element of today's talk. So we are very happy to have you here today. Your presentation or your paper will be discussed by another specialist on the topic, Adrian O'Claire. Adrian, I think, holds actually two engineering degrees from institutions that are located not so far from our campus here at the Paris School of Economics. But eventually, Adrian became an economist and received a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Adrian, you join us from Palo Alto today. Um, That's right. and, where you are an uh, assistant professor at Stanford University and where I believe it is very early in the morning. Um, so many thanks to you particularly for getting up that early. Let me just say a couple of words about practicalities and particularly Zoom etiquette. Um, the audience's microphones will be muted during Kurt's one hour talk. They will also be muted during Adrian's presentation of about 15 to 20 minutes, but there will be an open mic Q&A session thereafter for about 10 minutes uh, and the audience will also be able to ask questions in the chat. So if you click at the bottom of your screen on chat, then you'll be able um, to type a message there. I will read it, filter it, and ask it to the speakers of this guest. And now without much further ado, please, Kurt, tell us about the fiscal model. Okay, well, thank you very much, Toby, uh, for that very nice introduction. You, you've given like half the introduction to the paper, so it's like, you've saved me some time. Um, but anyway, so like, like Toby said, and I'm also, you know, thanks a lot to both uh, the Bank de France and the, the PSC for inviting me. Um, it's a, a great honor. So sorry that could not be there in person. I guess we all wish that situations were different where we presently are, uh, but we'll make do with what we have. Uh, so this is joint work with Marcus Hagedorn, who's at the University of Oslo, uh, and Yuri Minoski, who's at Canada. So, like Toby said, I mean, the, the question we're going after in this paper is very classic. You know, how does an increase in government spending affect output? And like Toby said, what we really want to try to do in this paper is the, to quantify what kind of everyone in their first, you know, macro, macro course uh, in university would taught is the Keynesian process. So, <clears throat> we want to quantify this idea that an increase in government spending uh, is going to increase aggregate demand. You know, here we're going to kind of use the, the typical assumption that because of some price rigidities, 
the increase in spending will partially lead to an uh, increase in aggregate demand, but not just a movement in prices. That increase in aggregate demand pushes up labor demand, uh, which is then going to push up employment and, and wages. And then that's going to feed back through to private consumption, which is where we'll get the name for the multiplier, because that increase in private consumption, again, because of price rigidities, leads to the multiplier and we go around in a circle until we reach equilibrium. You know, equilibrium may not have been on Keynes's mind when he kind of talked about the, the idea, but you know, that's what here we're going to use modern macro tools to, to try to quantify this response. Like Toby said, again, I, you know, I told you Toby you know, gave kind of half my intro for me. Uh, ideally, what we would do is you know, we could go out in the real world, we would have nice exogenous variation in government spending, and we could re-identify the effect of the, the size of the multiplier. It turns out that, you know, most governments don't just do things randomly. I mean, maybe more and more we're getting to a state of the world where that's true, especially kind of maybe the country where I come from. But uh, usually, you know, governments like to do things that are a bit thought out, which makes it difficult to identify the effects of spending because they're not exogenous. And so Valerie Ramey has a nice Jane Yale piece uh, that basically says that, you know, reasonable people can agree the multiplier is somewhere between a half and, and two. Uh, now here, I'll, let me be clear that one means that if you increase, you know, government spending by one dollar, then output increases by one dollar. Uh, some people call that a multiplier of zero because the, the multiplier effect is zero in that case. Uh, but just to be clear, one means, you know, a one for one increase in spending trans transmitted in output. So, you know, clearly, Two sounds a lot better than a half if you're going to use fiscal policy. So this is a range, you know, it seems like a small range, but you're kind of on both sides of the, the, you know, the magic number one that you'd like to know about. There's been some progress in using you know, local measures, but it's, you know, then you still need a theory of aggregation to understand how you can go from these local measures to the aggregate. And like Toby said, you know, it's every, every incidence of government spending is different, different, you know, it's hard to control for all changes, state dependence, everything else that could be going on. So typically what macroeconomists have resorted to is resorting to theory. And the, the workhorse theory is the, you know, the standard model for monetary economics, the representative agent the Keynesian model. Now, just to give you a flavor, you know, at the zero lower bound, you know, people find big numbers for the effect of the multiplier. You know, you get something bigger than three, aggregates and improvements speculate it could be infinite. Uh, so the, these numbers are, are pretty good. So where do we come in? So, you know, this is, Kind of a, a little bit of a, a joke from one of my senior colleagues is that you know we want to combine essentially the standard New Keynesian features uh, plus capital. So by we want to have rigidity in prices and wages, monopolistic competition in both product and labor markets, capital accumulation and adjustment costs. But we want to substitute out the consumption block from the the standard New Keynesian model to put in the heterogeneous agent in the free markets model in the style of Yuli and Marhuagi Hagi and Ayagari. And the idea of why we want to do this is that, you know, this is going to allow us, to, we think, to really discipline that in, in the kind of first part of the picture, what the private consumption response is going to be. You know, here we have a transitory increase in government spending that's going to lead to a transitory increase in incomes of people. How they choose to spend that, that, that increase in income is going to depend on kind of the distribution of earnings, consumption of wealth, what the distribution of marginal prices to consume is. And so we want to have a model that has realistic consumption behavior in response to these transitory shocks. Now, it turns out that, you know, so this framework we think is the one that, that models the key transmission mechanisms of stimulative policy. So it captures kind of everything on that, that first picture that I showed you in terms of the mechanisms. As a result, also, uh, my co-author Marcus shows that, you know, in this framework, we can also get price level determinacy. So that, you know, from the way that we're going to specify the fiscal policy, this is going to allow us to study a broader range of combinations of monetary and fiscal policy. For example, we'll, we can still be determinate even when we have a, a fixed nominal rate. And so what, what this framework is going to enable us to do is overcome some of the indeterminacy issues uh, in the liquidity trap that people like John Cochran have pointed out. Uh, and so that we're going to have a well-defined multiplier even at the, the zero lower bound or effective lower bound uh, when, when monetary policy can't respond. So we think that it's kind of, you know, it's a win-win uh, that we can do, uh, we, we capture the right transmission mechanisms and we can, uh, we can be well-defined. So before I get to the quantitative results, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what the transmission mechanisms are of fiscal stimulus and how, you know, how they're going to be different in the representative agent model as opposed to 
uh, the heterogeneous aging model. So how does, I mean, in, in the Lucchese model, how does fiscal stimulus work? Well, fiscal stimulus works by trying to, to generate inflation, to, you know, to move prices, uh, to get intertemporal substitution coming back to private consumption, right? You spend, prices go up, intertemporal substitution, private consumption goes up. In the representative Asian Keynesian model, the story ends there. I mean, that's basically the full effect. You get, you know, like at the ZLB, you get these big effects on the real rate that has big intertemporal substitution effects, big effects on private consumption. Everyone's the same. There's no redistributive effects. You know, that's kind of all out the window. Uh, that's, that's how it all works. When you have heterogeneity and incomplete markets, now the intertemporal substitution channel is more muted. It's still there, but it, it's not going to be as strong. And now you will have all these redistributive effects, uh, similar to you know kind of what Adrian has talked about you know in his book on monetary policy. The fact that you know when you change fiscal policy, that's still going to induce uh, a different distribution of in terms of the effect on earnings and taxes and hours. Uh, and so how how resources get reshuffled across people, uh, and depending on you know whether it goes to high NPC or low NPC people, how that ends up working uh, is going to have an effect on private consumption. So now, in addition to intertemporal substitution, we're also going to have the, the distributional channel. Next, also, we're going to have an investment channel. So obviously, you know, the, the, to the extent that prices affect, you know, consumption, they also affect savings. So the redistribution effects are still going to be there, just from the flip side. Uh, but changing the, the interest rate is going to have an effect on capital costs. So it's going to affect uh, demand for capital from firms. But also, you know, here, recording equivalence isn't going to hold. Uh, and so bonds are net wealth to, to households. So to the extent that the government could be using deficit financing in order to pay for the spending, uh, any increase in government debt is gonna have to be absorbed by the households in, in the economy, uh, which could potentially lead to a crowding out of investment, right? If, you know, for the same amount of savings, if there's more debt, then that means there has to be less capital. Uh, so we wanna be able to have, uh, be able to quantify also the, the investment channel uh, for, that sorry okay let's jump into the model so the essentially what we're going to kind of combine relatively standard elements from the heterogeneization model with standard elements from the new Keynesian model i'll kind of explain where things are you know a little bit non-standard and when we, where we kind of have to, to to take a stand on things uh but here households are going to be x any identical they're going to be exposed heterogeneous because they're exposed to shocks. They're going to have preferences over consumption and over leisure. Uh, they're going to discount the future with subjective discount factor beta. Uh, we're going to allow this to potentially be heterogeneous uh, across individuals. So you can think about this actually as having uh, an I subscript. We're going to have a McCurdy class of preferences. So uh, additively separable between consumption and, and hours and log, log preferences over uh, consumption. And phi here will be uh, the first elasticity. Now, households are going to be subject to labor productivity risk, uh, which we're going to assume follows the first order Markov chain, uh, but they're only going to have access to a state uncontingent asset, which is going to be the source of marketing influence. We can kind of immediately write the household problem recursively. Uh, so households, and I hear I'm already anticipating that households are going to be off the labor supply curve, so I'm not going to write that they're choosing their, their hours. Uh, so households are going to choose their consumption uh, and their savings to maximize the you know, period plus expected discounted utility. And households are going to basically going to finance their consumption savings out of previous period savings and then their after tax uh, earnings. So we're going to assume that there's a, an affine tax function here with a linear tax on labor uh, and a, a lump sum transfer. The joint distribution that is going to characterize that this economy is going to be over the asset positions and the, the productivity states. Uh, and here gamma just is the says how the, that distribution will evolve. On the, the production side, so we're essentially going to follow the Ersek, Henderson, and Levine set up or Levin set up for, for putting sticky wages into uh, the new Keynesian model. We just need to do a slight modification to deal with the fact that we have uh, idiosyncratic productivity for the workers. So, you know, essentially, you know, we're going to follow kind of the Keynesian tradition where, you know, everything is kind of done in steps so that then we can kind of put in the market power without having uh, it to have too, too much kind of adverse effects in terms of being able to solve. So there's going to be differentiated labor services indexed by J, 
Uh, there'll be different wages for those different labor services. Uh, this is essentially technology, how those hours uh, based on different productivities will aggregate across individuals. So kind of given the standard assumptions, there'll be downward sloping uh, demand in terms of for hours relative to the wage. Uh, and then we'll just get the equilibrium nominal wage uh, through the, the, the kind of standard Dixit Stiglitz aggregator. How are wages going to be set? So he, this is how we're going to do the, the sticky wages. So we're going to assume that there's a union that's going to set the nominal wage for all individuals. Uh, and the, the assumption here is essentially that the union is going to treat everyone equally. Um, so that's kind of the assumption basically the union can't figure out, you know, that some people would like to work more than others. So it's going to set the, the same nominal wage for all individuals because it's going to value uh, the, the disutility of uh, of work at the, the kind of the same marginal rate uh, of substitution. There's going to be quadratic wage adjustment costs. So here we're, we're not going to use Calvo so that we don't have to you know, think about there being potentially a distribution of wages across individuals. So we're just going to have Rottenberg so that uh, you can have the everyone having the, the same wage in, in every period. So the union's wage setting problem is going to be, they're going to come in with the previous period's nominal wage. They're going to choose the contemporaneous nominal wage uh, essentially to maximize the, the value to the, the households. And so how is it going to do that? Well, on the, you know, the plus side, uh, this is the, the after-tax uh, real earnings. So it's going to be integrating across households. We have the productivity times the after-tax nominal wage divided by the price level. And then this is taking into account that as you change the wage, you change the name amount of hours uh, that the intermediate goods firms or that the recruiting firms are going to demand. Now, this is where we were, are kind of taking uh, a stand on things is that, you know, the way that the union is going to value the disutility of working that many hours uh, is that here we're just going to take kind of the, the as if representative agent. So we're going to use the marginal utility evaluated at aggregate consumption or so, you know, average consumption in the, the economy uh, as a way to convert uh, the, the utils of working that many hours into consumption units. So this is a choice. I mean, this is, this is a, you know, an MRS that will converge to the representative agent one as we take the limit as inducing credit risk goes to zero, but it's not the only, you know, this is not the only way to, to do it. Uh, it's kind of you know, similar to the, the issues that you have if you have heterogeneous agents and asset pricing, you know, you don't have a unique SDF uh, to, to pin things down. So here we're, we're kind of taking a stand. Um, and so kind of what, one of the implications of this is that kind of high, you know, high consumption individuals will tend to be working more than they would like to. Low consumption individuals will be working less than they would like to, which we don't think is such a necessarily bad representation of, of the world. But that, they, they, we are taking a stand here on, on how we do that. Okay. For final goods, so we're going to assume, again, there's a final goods producer. It's going to aggregate a continuum of intermediates. You know, they also indexed by J. They're going to have some prices BJ. Again, standard Dixit Stiglitz aggregator with LCC substitution given by epsilon. Get the same kind of downward sloping demand as a function of the, the price. And again, the standard uh, equilibrium price index. In terms of the intermediate goods production, so here, like I said, we're going to have capital and labor. So the, the production function we're just going to assume is Cop Douglas. So there'll, there'll be some level of productivity Z uh, and uh, the capital share will be given by, by alpha. This is a typo, which should be F. We're also going to assume that there's a fixed cost of production. Uh, and we're going to calibrate that because we, we don't, we have kind of the sticky wages combined with uh, the fixed cost of production are going to help us make profits be small and not very cyclical. Uh, you know, Toby has a lot of work about kind of, and also Adrian about, you know, thinking about the cyclicality of profits and the size of profits, how that affects things in the New Keynesian model, and particularly when you have heterogeneous agents. So we, we're trying to minimize the issues of what happens with profits by kind of making profits small uh, and kind of as a cyclical as we can. Uh, and so that's the, the way that we're going to go about doing it. So, you know, you can kind of work out what the standard marginal cost formula is here, uh, given the, the confidence production. Uh, and then this is going to give rise to a standard New Keynesian Phillips curve uh, when we assume that there's price adjustment costs uh, in the style of, of Rottenberg. Uh, and we're, we're going to have a uh, frictional parameter given by theta. Okay. That's the production side. Now, you, you maybe have been wondering, I wrote that on a household problem that had one asset, and I talked at the beginning about there being bonds and there being capital, and you've seen capital, and we talked about government, but uh, the question is, how, how do we square those two things? Uh, so 
What we're going to do is we're going to assume that there's a mutual fund uh, that's going to solve the portfolio problem on behalf of the, the households. Uh, now, here I'll, I'll kind of preview to you that we're going to be solving, thinking about looking at uh, perfect foresight transitions from, from steady state. Uh, so in steady state, you know, the portfolio choice is, is indeterminate between these two assets. Uh, so we wouldn't, you know, our model has no kind of deep theory to say who would be holding what. Um, so this is kind of a device that's going to allow us to, you know, sidestep the issue of the, the portfolio choice and then kind of when we have, you know, unexpected shocks, how uh, kind of different portfolios would react, you know, it's just going to all be kind of coming from the mutual fund problem. So how is this going to work? So the mutual fund is going to collect uh, real household savings. It's going to offer a return given by our tilde, and then it can invest those savings in either bonds or capital. Now there's going to be aggregate uh, adjustment costs on the capital stock. So the mutual fund is going to be subject to these, these adjustment costs. Now, if you, the, the other assumption that we're going to make is kind of essentially pinned down by this last equation here is that the mutual fund can't retain earnings across periods. So the idea is that, you know, any investment it does today. So the kind of the, you know, the capital it has tomorrow plus the bonds it would have tomorrow plus any uh, adjustment cost would have to pay has to be financed out of current deposits. And so, you know, at the next period, it has to give back everything to the individuals. Once we, we, we've kind of done that, then we can set that the SDF of the, the, the mutual fund is just gonna be the real rate. So it's gonna promise the real rate. And then the, the second term is just saying that the mutual fund is gonna be indifferent between investing in bonds and investing in, in capital. Now, because of the adjustment costs, this mutual fund is gonna make profits. Uh, in steady state it won't because there's not gonna be any adjustment, but then kind of uh, away from steady state, there are gonna be profits. And the profits are basically just given by here, kind of, you know, the, the returns on capital and bonds net of what they had promised to the households. And so what we're gonna assume is that those, those dividends are gonna be taxed, uh, but they're gonna be rebated back to the households gonna be in proportion to their savings. So you can think about this mutual fund as, you know, there's some mutualization of, you know, you're promised, you're, you're guaranteed some certain interest rate, you know, are, are tilde A, but then you also get a share of the profits that the, the mutual fund is gonna make. And so the total return that shows up in your dynamic program is this RA, which is a combination of the, the stated return plus the, you know, the after-tax dividends that the mutual fund makes. So that's just how, how the, those profits are gonna end up being, being distributed. Kind of as you, you know, some investment vehicle that you, you put your money in. Okay, on the fiscal policy, like I've already said, we're gonna have an affine tax function uh, on nominal earnings and you know, with this nominal lump sum transfer. So basically, you know, if you kind of go down to the government budget constraint, the government is gonna issue new nominal debt to satisfy the previous government debt plus interest payments, plus the unvalued government expenditures. So this is gonna be exogenous. These could also be valued if they're valued in an additively separable way. Um, you know, as long as there's no complementarity between government consumption and either hours or, or private consumption, it's not going to, to matter. Um, so you should think about, you know, again, think about this as really government consumption, uh, not anything about investment that would have an impact on production. Uh, and so we're going to take those exogenous. Uh, like I said, for the positive, anything I say positively today, it doesn't matter if you have added the separable utility, it would matter for welfare, but it's not going to matter for the positive results. The government is going to fully tax firm, the intermediate goods firm profits. Uh, it's going to have the collect these taxes on uh, on the mutual fund profits, and then finally have the, the labor taxes. So that's going to be the, the government budget. And again, the government budget is specified in nominal terms. So this is a Ricardian budget. It's going to hold for all price levels. Uh, so you know we're going to have some some fiscal anchor that's going to be coming from not like a coming from fiscal policy, but it's not driven by the fiscal theory of the price level. It's going to be coming from a different mechanism that we have in the theory. Okay, just to give you an overview of the, the calibration. So on the household side, uh, you know, in terms of the income risk uh, and in order to match the wealth distribution, we're going to follow uh, the handbook chapter that I wrote with Dirk Kruger and Fabrizio Perry. Uh, essentially, we're going to use uh, preference heterogeneity, like I, I pointed out, in terms of discount factors in order to generate uh, the, the high inequality in wealth. Uh, again, we're not going to be able to explain kind of the super high concentration in the top 1%, uh, but our view is kind of, you know, the top 1% concentration is not really what 
you know, to the extent that we can measure, you know, consumption and things in, in the data, we don't really know what those people do, uh, but we're going to at least get the consumption dynamics of the people uh, in, you know, the, the bottom 95% uh, match pretty well, we think, and so uh, that we're going to do a good job in terms of matching uh, the consumption block. We're just going to follow Chetty, pick a fresh elasticity of a half. Uh, for the markups, we're going to set them to, to be 10%. For the slopes of the, the two Phillips curves, uh, we're going to pick 0.03, so something, you know, the Phillips curve we know is pretty flat. Some people will say that this is like very flat. Other people will, I think, would say that it should be like, we should add another zero so that it could be much flatter. Uh, so we think this is kind of in the, you know, the conservative range uh, of, of estimates for the, the slope of the Phillips curve. For the, the calibration of the, the government, essentially we're going to set government spending, the labor tax, the dividend tax, and that's GDP, and then we're going to let the transfers adjust to clear the budget and steady state. Uh, this number, it may look a bit low. This is because we calibrated it to just to be the federal spending. Um, so if you're used to a higher number, that also, you know, if you include state and local governments, then, then things get a bit bigger. Um, you know, quantitatively, I mean, it's not going to have a big impact on the, the results, whether we, you know, put 14% there or put 6%. They said we wanted to have small profits uh, of an intermediate goods firm, so we're going to calibrate. This is the, the fixed cost uh, in order to make profit zero in steady state. And then we're going to fix the nominal interest rate at zero for the baseline experiments. This is because we want to isolate the effects of fiscal policy. I'm going to show you results also where we kind of put in a standard Taylor rule. Uh, but for now, we're just going to have a peg in the fixed nominal interest rate so that we can study the effects of fiscal policy in isolation. And then we can see what happens when you add in an active monetary response uh, to, to the, the fiscal policy. And so here, you know, it's kind of the idea of using the incomplete markets combined with the nominal government budget is going to give us determinacy to be able to have a well-defined uh, well defined experiments even when we have uh, an interest rate. Okay. In terms of model fit, you know, we think we do a pretty good job in terms of matching kind of the wealth distribution, the bottom 40% don't have much wealth, but they account for a non-trivial amount of consumption. Uh, the annual MPC of transfer income is 0.4. You know, maybe that's even a bit low that we could boost it up. Um, you know, I know kind of the, the Norwegian data that, that Adrian uses in, in his paper, I think it's suggesting closer to 0.6. So here, maybe we're being a bit conservative in, in terms of what the, the MPC is. But that's kind of what we've done. Okay, so before going to general equilibrium, I think it's going to, it's useful, especially for you know, those of you that maybe aren't kind of so familiar with the exact dynamics of uh, these heterogeneous agent models, you know, what, what the dynamic response of consumption is going to look like in just in partial equilibrium. So each of these figures, each of the lines in these figures corresponds to a different experiment where households are given a transfer uh, at different dates in time. But what's important is that the information about the transfer always arrives in period zero. So the blue line here is you wake up, you get a transfer of $10, and then nothing else happens. The purple line is you wake up today, and you find out in 12 quarters, you're going to get a transfer of $10. So there's a partial equilibrium. So all of these curves are going to integrate to one uh, because the, you know, the total you know, the real rate is zero, and everything is eventually spent. So what's going on? Let's think about the, this blue line here first. So Think about the, the people that are at the boring constraint. Their NPC is one, they're going to spend the full $10 right away. If you think about kind of low asset households, you know, they're not exactly at the borrowing constraint, but they're still going to consume a significant amount of the, the transfer today. And kind of as people get higher and, and higher wealth, then the NPC is falling uh, and their the spending is going to go down and they're going to kind of defer that savings further out into the future. So we get this decaying kind of pattern of spending that ends up being high at first and then decays. If you compare that to the purple line, now here, you know, if you had a permanent income, if you compare this to like a permanent income household, the permanent income household, when it gets the news that it's going to have this increase in, uh, in income in 12 quarters, it would increase its consumption today and keep it constant for all, all the periods. It would basically, the consumption response would be the same between the blue and the purple, just subject to a little bit of, of discounting, uh, but you know, they would look the same. Here, we get very different behavior, because if you think again back to that, that hand to mouth household, well, it would like to increase its consumption out of the news that it's going to be richer in the future, but it's already at the borrowing constraint, so there's no way that it can do that. And again, those low asset households, you know, their, their ability to kind of pull forward that income is low. And kind of, you know, people who don't expect to be on their order equation in every period between now and, and quarter 12 
aren't going to be responding as much. Who is going to respond? Well, the people that have a lot of wealth, but they have low NPCs, so we get this much, much smaller response. And then eventually, as we get closer to the time when the transfer arrives, then the, you know, the people who are more and more constrained are starting to being able to, to respond, and we eventually get that peak. The other thing to note is that you know, here, the, the household behavior can be highly nonlinear. So if you scale up the transfer to, to $10,000, well, here, you know, even the guy at the barn constraint, all of a sudden, you know, ten thousand dollars, it's not going to go out and spend all ten thousand. That's enough to help overcome some of the precautionary savings. And so there, you know, you're going to have a significant amount of savings, even though uh, people kind of originally with the barn constraint. So this is going to give the idea that it could be, you know, more is not always necessarily better when it comes to, to government spending because that private consumption response. If we think that NPCs are falling in kind of the additional amount of, of transitory income you get, then you know, you're going to get less bang for your buck the more spending that you do. Now, you may be wondering, okay, you know, I understand representative agent model, it's no good, NPC is bad, but we have this other great model, the two agent New Keynesian model, um, by, that was you know, championed by a, a former uh, faculty member of KSC, uh, Florian Bilby. Uh, that, you know, there we can put in these hand to mouth guys and then we're going to get the, the quarterly or the annual NPC kind of exactly right. Uh, do we really need, you know, in that model, it's like we just add one extra equation. It's like super easy. This whole distribution, not necessary. Well, this is to show you what happens if you, if you look at tank, just to kind of run those, those same responses, you can see you get these spiky responses. Why? Because you get no, no anticipation effects, right? If your discount factor is zero, it doesn't matter, you know, if you have the, this news of transfers coming in the future, you're never going to respond until the transfers actually arrive. Also, you know, you're going to get this kind of pure linearity. It doesn't matter if I give, if you're handing them out, I give you $10, give you $10,000, you know, I give you $100 million, you're just going to go out and spend it all at once. Uh, so that, you know, the, the dynamics of the model could be quite different. Now, what we think is, is particularly important uh, are these dynamic aspects. Uh, and so this is what, you know, Adrian and his co-authors, you know, have kind of come to term the, the intertemporal Keynesian cross. Uh, and this is the kind of view of flavor of like the first round of what this intertemporal uh, in, importance is going to be. So here now we've com I've combined all the experiments into one. So you wake up and you find you're going to get four transfers at these four different times. Now, the, the tank economy, okay, you see that the, the permanent income guy moved up a little bit, so there's a little bit of space there between uh, the origin and his line, but the, the hand to mouth people, you know, they, doesn't matter, you know, they just respond by consuming everything at the time that it arrives. Now, the incomplete markets households, you know, they, they're still getting the same $10 now, but their NBC is almost double. Why? Well, because they know now that their income in the future is also going to increase. And so that increase in future income relaxes the precautionary savings motive for households today, which encourages them to spend more. So now you can think about, you know, why, you know, Adrian, you know, and his father calls it the intertemporal Keynesian cross, because now all of a sudden, you know, I'm, my consumption today responds to all of my future income. So if my, future, my, my future income has gone up, then I'm going to respond even more today. But then if everyone's does this, then, then today and in every future period, then all of my future income is also going to go up, which is going to further push up my income today, which is going to further push up my consumption today. Uh, and this is something that you just completely miss in tank because you, you don't have, you know, I mean, you, you get it a little bit, you know, the permanent income guy, he moved from whatever 0.001 to 0.002, um, but you, you know, you don't get this kind of action. So this is, this is basically the idea that we're going to push with to be able to, to want to quantify. Okay, so I've said this a little bit, but this is essentially the experiment. We're going to think about the economy as starting off in, in steady state. Then we're going to have MIT shocks, which are going to basically be an increase in government spending. It's going to go up and then it's going to decay at a rate of G uh, and eventually G will go back to the, the previous steady state level. So it's a trend, you know, it's persistent, uh, but eventually we're going to go back to the same level of, of government spending. Here again, we're going to assume basically after the shock occurs, everything's perfect foresight. So there'll be some unexpected things to happen in period zero, but then everyone fully understands the transition back uh, to the potentially new steady state. Oops, one too far. Okay, so it would be good, you know, 
there is empirical evidence on what the multiplier is. And so it would be good to know before I tell you that, you know, we're going to do these experiments to study the, you know, different arrangements of monetary and fiscal policy and different state dependence of our, of our model. It'd be good to, to you know, show you that the model actually does a reasonable job in matching the data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show you that we can match the empirical evidence from uh, the JPE paper of Ramey and Zuberi. So what they do is that they use identified government spending shocks. They have shock series that they construct based on uh, military spending, and they also use uh, Blanchard Perotti shocks in order to, to solve for these multipliers. And what they, what they report in their paper are two and four year cumulative multipliers. So essentially, if you just kind of sum up, you know, all of the real increase in, in output and all divided by all of the real increase in spending over two years, or over four years, that tells you what the, the cumulative multiplier is. Now, what's important is that in order to be, what we want to do is we, we really want to replicate the you know, they, they're going to compute the, this kind of these average multipliers over the, we're going to focus on the post-war period because we think that's kind of what our model is best approximated of. That in their paper, it goes back to like 1880. I don't think that our model is necessarily a good description of, you know, 1890 US, maybe, maybe it is, but we're going to kind of look, focus on the, the post-war period. So what we want to need to do is we need to feed in kind of what the policy response is, right? Because we don't, here we don't have Ricardian equivalents. So we can't just say, oh, well, this spending is going to be financed with lump sum transfers, that it's not going to matter. Uh, here, it's really going to matter what the fiscal authority does in order to, to pay for the spending, and also what the monetary authority does uh, in response to these shocks. So we need to feed in both the, the kind of the path of spending, the path of taxes, the, you know, to match the path of, path of deficits that we see from, uh, from these experiments. So, Thankfully, Ramey and Zuberi, they estimated the fiscal responses. So they, they kind of tell us what the path of uh, tax revenue and, and deficits are so that we can match. Uh, but they, they didn't estimate the response of, of monetary policy. Uh, so that, that we needed to do. So we basically, uh, we took their you know, replication kit and then here, this is maybe a little bit hard to sell, but this is basically, uh, this is the three month T-bill rate. So they estimate this via local projections. Uh, what well, you can see, and this is maybe a little bit small, this is zero, the, this is 95% CI. Essentially, it looks like the monetary policy response to these shocks is zero. Uh, so that's what we're gonna run with. Uh, so we're going to essentially feed in the, we're gonna match the path of the, the deficits and of the, the tax revenue from Ramey Zuberi uh, and we're going to keep the nominal rate fixed at steady state, and that's what we're, then we're going to compute the two and four year multipliers from, from that. And so this is the same again. Whether you use there, this is the you know the military spending shocks, uh, or you you use the bunch of corrupt ones. Okay, so how do we do? Let's look. You know, let's look at kind of these results first. So this is kind of on the, the full sample. Like I said, again, we're using here the post-war sample period, so not the, the back to the 1880s uh, sample. So in the data, the two and four cumulative multipliers kind of are 0.70, about 0.75 and 0.5. Uh, in our model, we get 0.73 and 0.58. Uh, so again, this is, you know, we could have targeted this directly, but that's not, you know, we, we just kind of, given our steady state calibration and what we put in for number of we wanted to see that we were in the right ballpark. Uh, again, we're going to say that this is this is success that we're able to replicate those findings. They do in the the post-war sample. They look at some state dependence in the the Ramey Zuberi paper, kind of dividing it up based on whether uh, we have high or low unemployment. Now they basically say that. You know, the kind of their words is that, you know, the, the empirical results kind of of the state dependence post-war is not very robust. Uh, you can see, I mean, here you get massive negative multipliers in the high unemployment regimes. Uh, so, you know, our model is not able to generate those large negative numbers, but, you know, the, even ratings are very kind of don't say that, you know, they don't really trust uh, this, this state dependence exercise. So this is just to show you that we did it. And so we, you know, we do get that the multipliers are lower uh, in the, the high unemployment regime. Um, so it's like the sign is correct, but again, we're, they kind of cast a bit of doubt on those numbers, but we just wanted to report them for completeness. Uh, so what we're going to say is that, you know, where, where the empirical findings are robust, 
we match the data. Given that we, there's, you know, there's episodes where the empirical findings don't seem to be robust, now we're going to use the model as a leverage way to think about uh, those cases where we don't have a lot of power in the data to say something. Okay, so for most of the experiments that we're going to run, we're going to consider two types of, of financing. So these are, going to be, these are different from the Ray Mizubari financing that we could also do, but here, here we just kind of want to, to make the points very clearly about what's going on with uh, the differences in the fiscal policy. So we want to pick two fiscal policies that in the representative agent model would be identical. So in the first, it's going to be just a balanced budget. So not all that's going to be kept constant and transfers are going to be adjusted to pay for the spending. That's this side. That's kind of you know, the classic benchmark, uh, you know, Baxter King. Then we're going to think about what we think is a bit more of, you know, a realistic policy in the sense that a lot of times government spending is deficit finance. So here we're going to let the, the debt grow. Uh, and then after 40 quarters, we're going to cut transfers in order to pay it back. We can also do this with the labor tax. Uh, again, we wanted to do something with transfers because again, these, you know, under Ricardian equivalence, these two financing regimes are identical. So they would give the exact same results in the, the representative agent model. With, they're going to get very different results in, in our model. What I'm going to report to you, and here's also the path of the, of the dynamic multiplier. So this is going to be just the increase in output in period T relative to the initial real government spending response. Uh, it's kind of something that's typically reported in these models. And then what we want to be able to do is compare, we you know, talk about how important it is, you know, heterogeneity is. And then we also want to talk about how important getting these dynamic multiplier effects are. And so what we're going to do is we want to try to isolate just the intertemporal substitution channel. You know, if you remember the representative agent model, we really only have the intertemporal substitution channel being active, at least in terms of private consumption. And so what we want to do is essentially kind of solve for the complete markets allocation with the incomplete markets prices. So, you know, we, we could solve also just the rank model, uh, but there then we have different prices. So there'd be different real rates. So the strength, you know, the strength of intertemporal substitution would be different. So here, the idea is that we just want to say, given the path of the real rate from the incomplete markets model, what would that have implied for the intertemporal substitution in the representative agent model? We can do the kind of the same thing in tank, and then in tank, you just isolate the static multiplier effect, whereas you miss out on the dynamics that we talked about. Okay. We're also, you know, we also want to be able to try to decompose, you know, how the private consumption response uh, is going to respond to, to prices. Obviously, it's very difficult uh, in general equilibrium to say exactly what's going on. So here, you know, we're, we're kind of leaning on insights that, you know, Adrian was a, kind of a big contributor to of kind of using partial equilibrium decomposition just to understand more about the, the general equilibrium. And so essentially, if we want to think about how does government spending affect total output, obviously there's the direct effect of actual changing government spending. Then we want to think about, you know, what's, what's the direct impact of that, like kind of like the first round, like the direct impact of that spending on private consumption. So this is saying we force people to work more to produce that government spending. How would their spending change? Just because of their, their income goes up by the amount of hours needed to produce it. So it's kind of like the first round if we think about how do we get to, to GE. Uh, then obviously taxes and transfers are going to adjust. So kind of on top of the direct impact, then we allow the taxes and transfers to change. Then obviously, you know, in equilibrium, wages and total hours are going to be different than just the steady state wage and that, that kind of direct impact. So we add that back in. Uh, and then finally, we look at the indirect effect of the price level and the uh, so this is going to get to, to help give some intuition for what's going on. Okay, so this is the first set of results. So this is going to be the, the balanced budget case. We're going to keep the nominal debt constant. Uh, so here now we've scaled everything to be in percent of output. So this is you know a 1% increase in government spending. Remember, government spending is 6% of output in the setup. So it's a 0.06% increase in, in output. What we can see here is that output goes up by less then government spending uh, and private consumption here falls on impact. So as you might expect, we get a multiplier that's less than one. So what's going on here? So if you kind of turn your attention to the, the decomposition, well, what do we get? Obviously the, the direct impact, this red dashed line, that's gonna be the same in all these experiments because you know it's the same spending shock and the, you know, at the first round, we just 
no other prices or quantities have adjusted, so that's always going to look the same. That obviously always pushes up consumption. But it turns out that if you look at this yellow line, which is coming from the taxes and transfers, that more than offsets all of this direct impact of the spending. You know, and it kind of makes sense if you take money away in a lump sum fashion from an economy where the average NPC is very high, then consumption is going to fall. And people also, you know, know that kind of persistently their, their, their income is falling coming from these, these cutting transfers. Uh, and so that is what leads, you know, kind of in the, you know, to this, this fall in consumption, uh, so that then even hours and wages fall relative to this direct impact case. And so that's why we get this multiplier that's about 0.6. Now, it turns out that, you know, if you, if you compare this to rent and tank, you would have inferred kind of just looking from intertemporal substitution that we would have gotten a multiplier of about one. You know, here, you know, with the fiscal policy, we're, we're going back, you know, to the same, you know, the, the, the long run price level is going to be the same as it was before. So the cumulative inflation, you know, really is kind of being pinned down to be almost one. So for, with a fixed nominal rate, you know, kind of from the, the standard complete markets logic, we're always going to be kind of left with a multiplier that's about one, uh, because that's what the, the cumulative impact of inflation is going to be. But that's kind of missing out on all of, you know, all of the redistributive elements, which kind of, you know, makes sense here that, the you know, lump sum transfers don't matter at all for the representative agent, but here the lump sum transfers are giving a big redistribution kind of away from the, the high NPC people, which is leading to the lower consumption response. Okay, now we can turn to the, the deficit finance case. So, you know, the lower right again is the, the fiscal policy. Here, now you can see output increases by more than government spending, consumption goes up on impact. Uh, so we get a multiplier above one, something about 1.35. What has changed to what we've had before? Well, now, you know, the cut in transfers, it's still, you know, transfers are still going to go down, but now it's coming out in the future. Remember, you know, the representative agent, they wouldn't care whether it's now or later, you you get all the same response. And you can see that when the transfers arrive, obviously you do get a drop in consumption when these things have to be paid back. But if you remember those partial equilibrium kind of figures I showed you in the beginning, the high NPC people, you know, something that's happening 40 quarters from now, they don't expect they don't expect to be on their other equation between now and then, and so they're not going to respond today to that uh, expected future income loss. So they're happy to spend out of this transitory increase in income, uh, and so we're able to get, you know, kind of that this first round in increase in consumption is then amplified kind of by, uh, you know, the second round response of, of wages and, and hours. So we get this multiplier that it's bigger than one because essentially we, you know, we push this repayment. Uh, off further into the future, and so the high NPC people aren't aren't responding to it. Again, similar to what I said before, you know, with rank, again, kind of the, the cumulative inflation is kind of always going to be about uh, one, so we're going to be left with a multiplier that's around one in, in the setup. With tank, we get a little bit more kick uh, coming from you know the, the deficit financing because again, the that kind of static multiplier effect is there, but. Uh, we still get a gap coming from these dynamic effects of knowing that your income is going to be persistently high. Okay. Uh, I, I want to talk kind of just very briefly about the investment channel. Um, this is much more difficult to quantify and I don't, I'm not sure that we have fully come up with the cleanest way to identify this. Uh, but essentially, you know, if you think about total savings for the households, we can try to do a similar decomposition because the total savings is just going to have to equal capital plus bonds plus uh, adjustment costs. So we want to kind of do an experiment where we, we solve for the counterfactual capital and real rate uh, that would have prevailed kind of if government debt had been constant. So kind of keeping all other prices at the equilibrium prices. We basically want to solve the household problem and that first order condition of the mutual fund, right? That made it indifferent between investing in capital and bonds, such that you know we have this fixed point that given that path for the real rate, the savings is going to be kind of given by this path for capital and a constant real debt. Uh, and that, that also would satisfy the first order condition of the mutual fund. So the idea is that this would be kind of consistent with savings and investment decisions. Uh, if government debt were constant, to give a sense of kind of what what effect of crowding out on capital the real rate we have. So just to kind of show you like what what ends up happening, the blue line here is going to be total savings uh, a. Then if we think about you know what would happen if we had just if we if the real rate hadn't changed in response to the spending, that kind of moves us to R. So that kind of says how how different savings would have been 
uh, you know, without the change in the rate, so kind of what intertemporal substitution is doing. Then between the red line and the, the black line, that says, you know, what if we actually kept, you know, all of the other prices, constants of the real rate, wages, and, and, and taxes. That says kind of what's coming from the redistributional channel. Then this yellow line is that path of capital that I showed you that we saw from this crowding out experiment. Uh, and so that kind of last line tells you what's kind of crowding out from the, the government bonds. So there's basically, you know, intertemporal substitution, redistribution, and then uh, crowding out from, from government spending. So, again, well, I'm curious to see what people think about this decomposition because it, it, we, we thought it was kind of the, the well, it was one way to, to explain it, but I, that all of those are kind of coming into play through that, that decomposition. So I promised you that we would put in a, a Taylor rule. Uh, so now we've put in, uh, you know, a Taylor rule that, that is going the active monetary policy. Uh, and here I'm going to do it just in the, the deficit finance case. We also have it in the, in the paper in the uh, the tax finance case. But one of the things that you can see now is that we get uh, crowding out of both private consumption and investment uh, on an impact. Uh, and it, you know, if you think about what does fiscal stimulus do? Fiscal stimulus tries to push up prices. Uh, if at the same time the monetary authority is committed to fighting the increase in prices, then you know the left hand is fighting the right hand. Uh, and you know you're going to increase uh, the cost of capital by raising the, the real rate. You're going to you know make people want to intertemporally substitute more by increasing the real rate, making them save. Uh, and so you're going to decrease the, the size of the multiplier. Uh, and so here you know we get something that's around uh, 0. 0.7. So you know the the results that we kind of found you know we show that we obviously like kind of it's, it's been known that monetary policy in and of itself is important uh, for kind of explaining whether or not you get bigger. Uh, bigger or smaller multipliers, and you know, interestingly, interestingly, you know, we get uh, similar kind of responses in terms of the the, the as ifs between rank and tank uh, when we have this active monetary policy. One last experiment that we can do uh, in sticking in steady state uh, is we can look at the the response to a nominal transfer. Uh, so here, it just you know, we give people a lump sum transfer today. Uh, and we kind of have the same the same path that we would have for spending, uh, and then we just pay it back later. So again, representation household, this would do nothing because you know the Freddie Krueger, you give it, you save it, you pay it back. Now you know here we we get you know output and can, private consumption is going to increase, so we get a multiplier again that's around something of about 0.7. Again, it's basically all coming from the indirect you know taxes and transfers because again we're just basically giving the, the taxes and transfers to people. Um, if we kind of looked at the the you know the rank and tank as if here again in the rank you know there's no spending and we just have kind of the path of the real rate so we would refer you know a multiplier of basically zero uh, slightly negative we get a little bit a little bit bigger with tank from this kind of static increase in spending uh, from the, the the higher transfer but you're missing out again on this big uh, big anticipation effect of people knowing that they have this persistent increase uh, in the the transfers that they're Okay, so that's kind of, you know, to what we've seen kind of thinking about the, in normal times, to think about how different spending, you know, different financing is going to matter, uh, how the response to monetary policy is going to matter. Now we want to try to look at state dependence. So what we're going to do is we, we want to generate, you know, a big demand driven recession in the model. Uh, and so we're going to do what, you know, you do in the New Keynesian model when you want to have a big recession is you, we wake up and for a long time, uh, everyone decides to become more patient, and because we're more patient, we have uh, a drop in demand and we get a big recession. So you can see here, you know, output falls something uh, like like seven percent. We kind of tried to mimic something like the Great Recession. We get some deflation. You know, private consumption falls almost ten percent, uh, and you know, wages also are, are going to fall. The real rate rises. And this is kind of what we're going under the assumption that nominal government debt is is kept constant. So now what we're going to do is we're going to repeat the same spending experiments, the same spending experiments, uh, but they, they take place kind of starting in the first period of liquidity trap. So kind of from when the discount back. So this is the tax finance experiment. Uh, so you know one of the things that we can see here is that you know qualitatively this looks basically the same as what we had before. Output goes up by less than government spending. We get crowding out of private consumption. Uh, so we get a multiplier that's less than one. You know, we've we've moved up, so we've kind of gone from something like 0.6 to about 0.75. Uh, so the multiplier has has gotten bigger. 
Uh, so we do, you know, there's some mild state dependence going on here, uh, but it's nothing like, you know, those numbers I showed in the beginning, we haven't gone from 0.6 to, to 3. Uh, we, you know, we've gone from 0.6 to 0.75. And, you know, in terms of the decomposition, again, again it basically looks the same. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we find things, things with transfers are making, uh, making the policy look, look worse. I can show you again also for the deficit finance case, again, qualitatively, everything looks the same as when we're outside the liquidity trap. Uh, the multiplier does increase some, but not, not huge amounts. And if, I mean, if you think about it, you know, what's going on, you know, we talked about these different channels, right? There's the inner temporal substitution channel, there's the redistribution channel, and there's also the, the capital investment channel. You know, here, how does the inner temporal substitution channel change? Well, you know, we, we do have a movement in the real rate due to the liquidity trap, but we don't have these kind of huge you know, massive 20% deflations that you can get in the representative agent model, where then for fiscal policy, you can get big movements to the real rate, which have big, big effects here. Movements to the real rate are kind of mild. And so, you know, how much you move from spending is also mild. Uh, also in terms of the redistributional component here, you know, I mean, it could be also that this is not, you know, the shock is not really one that affects the, the distribution very much. We kind of all become patient, you know, we have through the way we do wages and, and things. You know, there's not there's not a big change in how the resources are redistributed across individuals, uh, and so kind of the various you know the, the transmission mechanisms at play are not very different between whether you're in a liquidity trap or or not, um, and so we shouldn't expect to get very different results because it's not you know we're not either having much bigger movements in the real rate or much bigger redistribution across people. Um, you know, you can think about that. You know, maybe then we should be thinking about shocks that. You know, do result in big redistribution kind of line up with what we see in the in the empirical data, but at least kind of for this type of setup, you're not going to get uh, get big effects. I want to say one <coughs> one thing about uh, the New Keynesian model and the liquidity trap is that you know the, there's this paradox of, of flexibility that uh, Von Werning kind of pointed out in this paper and that you know, John Carver has talked about uh, that when you you know the, as prices and wages become more flexible, you get these bigger and bigger deflations in the, in the liquidity trap uh, that you can get bigger and bigger multipliers. Uh, and we just want to show here that kind of in our benchmark economy, as you take, uh, this is the, you know, these are the rigidities. So as you take the rigid, uh, rigid there should be a B, uh, as you take the rigidities to zero, uh, the multipliers will behave and it converges to the, the flex price multiplier. So at least we're, we're kind of in a, you know, we're in a regime where it looks like, you know, where the limit is converging to the actual limit point uh, so that the, the model doesn't have the, this paradox in it. Um, this is kind of coming again from the equilibrium determination with the fiscal policy uh, that, you know, because the long-run price level is pinned down, you don't have, have these divergence. So this is kind of, we think this is a, a nice feature of the model to, to go, go forward. So I have a few, a few more minutes. Um, and so I wanted to throw in, this is something that's not in the paper. Uh, but this is something just a little bit topical for thinking about kind of stabilization in the eurozone, um, and you know it's particularly it's a potentially a way to rethink the ECB mandate in kind of a, a broader sense, right? The ECB mandate is to maintain price stability. This is you know from the the, the treaty for the, the eurozone, particularly Article One Two Three One. If you are a economic legal scholar. But you know the, the current paradigm that when people talk about monetary economics, they really emphasize this separation between you know the nominal rate and then any kind of policy that looks like a fiscal policy. But the question is, you know, if you take a policy that's motivated to stabilize prices, is that a fiscal policy or a monetary policy? I mean, it kind of seems like something that you do that tries to stabilize prices, that's a monetary policy objective. So that can be interpreted as a monetary policy tool. And that's what we're going to say is that you know, when you start thinking kind of in, in Hank or kind of any model where you have this active fiscal policy, but you know, particularly it's powerful in Hank, that there's not necessarily clear a separation between traditional monetary and fiscal options. And you know, the, the treaty was kind of designed to avoid excessive inflation, but it, you know, it neglects the fact that you might be able to kind of use these more traditional fiscal instruments to fight deflationary pressures, particularly when you know, the traditional tools have uh, Kind of reach the, uh, the limit. And so, you know, it could be that the ECB needs help from the member state treasuries in order to stabilize prices. You know, at the, I don't know, I guess the ECB has gone negative, so it should be the ELB, not the ZLB, but you know, we've been using the ZLB in, in the, the paper so far. 
It could be that the ECB wants to ask member states to spend to generate inflation. And so, you know, the, the treasuries are kind of maintaining price stability on behalf of the ECB. You know, as long as the goal really is to, to promote price stability, uh, it's not clear that this should, couldn't be interpreted as monetary policy. Um, and you know, just to be clear, ultimately whether or not inflation is generated depends on the fiscal policy path, not directly on what the ECB does. You know, whether you monetize the debt or not, you know, an IOU from the central bank or an IOU from the government, you know, it's basically going to be the same. I mean, you know, maybe we trust the ECB more than, uh, than some governments. We're not going to name any names, but, you know, in this type of model, though, whether it's money or whether it's a nominal bond that pays zero, you would treat that any differently. And so we kind of just make this point in, we wrote this little note of thinking about kind of COVID, what you could do, uh, where you have kind of a, a big demand and a, and a supply shock at the, the same time, the kind of what you do with the path of uh, a government of the uh, government debt in response to a stimulus is going to matter a lot for what the initial inflation response is. And so here we kind of compare just, you know, this big supply and demand shock, which is in blue, with, you know, a big fiscal stimulus, but one that we pay, that we pay back kind of after everything is over. Uh, so you can see the red here is the path of the, the government debt. So you know, we eventually pay back the go to the same nominal level. So this would be kind of what the you know, the Germans would want to do that they, you know, in the constitution, they have this nominal debt target that they would like to keep. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, you don't get much, you don't get much bang when you pay this back. But if you, if you essentially just roll over the debt forever, uh, so that you, you know, whether you completely monetize it or just permanently expand the, the nominal debt, then, you know, you get a lot more bang for your buck in terms of the inflation and in terms of the output gain that you get. Now here I'm not showing output because, you know, the, the objective of the ECB is to stabilize prices. So if, you know, if as a side benefit output also increases, that's great, but that's not, you know, the ECB should only care about, you know, hitting this average 2% inflation target. And so, you know, asking fiscal authorities to do this can, can help the ECB reach that if it can't respond with, with monetary policy. So this is just to say, you know, once you start to, you know, one, what, when you kind of have these Hadrian New Keynesian models, where really you see this this strong kind of interrelationship between monetary and fiscal policy, you know, it you know it, it doesn't mean it's not so clear again that we should have this strict separation of the, the two tools. Uh, and you know, it, obviously in normal times when you can use the nominal rate to stabilize prices, you should do that. But if you end up in extraordinary circumstances, you know, it could be better. You know, to have these for the ECB to essentially encourage or support these expansionary fiscal policies, because it also has the advantage of you know compared to something like QE, you know, if if the the treasuries know the policies that will push up prices the most, that's more targeted and should be you know cheaper from the point of view of the ECB than kind of an indiscriminate QE policy, which just buys bonds, you know, which is not targeting exactly kind of the objective of you know, where for each dollar of spending what generates the most. Uh, you know, the most price stable. So anyway, that's something, something to think about uh, kind of in the, the broader stimulation, the broader view of kind of the separation between monetary and fiscal uh, of, of how we should do this. And then, I mean, if you look at like the Fed in the US, I mean, it seems like central banks are kind of pushing more and more into, you know, now engaging in direct lending, things that we maybe would have called fiscal policy, but are all being kind of used to, to support, support prices. So just to conclude, um, you know, we put together this heterogeneous new Keynesian model, which we think has the key ingredients necessary to, to quantify the effects of fiscal stimulus. We have distributional effects, intertemporal motives, an investment channel, a uniquely determined price level, and, you know, we a uniquely determined fiscal multiplier for this kind of broad class of, of monetary and fiscal policies, including at the, the ZLB. You know, the, the main quantitative results, we found that the deficit finance multipliers can be larger than if you, if you tax finance it with, uh, with the balance budget. The multipliers in liquidity trap are going to be similar to what we had uh, in, in normal times in contrast to, to complete markets. And here it's, you know, what, what we kind of want to argue is that it's, you know, it's really, it's not so much the state dependence that matters. It's, you know, it's the, the lack of response from, from monetary policy. Uh, and so kind of in the representation model, you have both, you know, the state dependence and the lack of response from monetary policy kind of come hand in hand with the way that the experiments are done. Here, given that we can separate it, it's really, you know, it's clear from what I showed you the, the Taylor rule cases that if you have active monetary policy, multipliers are much smaller. Uh, and so it's really it's the response of monetary policy, not so much the state dependence that's giving you uh, the big kick. 
And you know, distributional effects are important, you know, from those as-if experiments that we did uh, for, for figuring out what, you know, for accounting for how big the multipliers are. So that is all I have. Hopefully I am just about on time. So thank you very much, Kurt. I think you're spot on time according to my clock anyway, and we will go straight ahead to Adrian's discussion. Please, Adrian. Uh, so I'm not going to be discussing Kurt's uh, controversial policy proposal at the end. I'll stick to just the discussion of the paper itself. Um, so just a, kind of a, just to situate the contribution of the paper, the, the, the paper asks this really big macro uh, question uh, that also, um, you know, both Toby and Kurt uh, were mentioning is one of the crucial macroeconomic questions out there, which is that of what the effect is of a fiscal expansion and here it's either um, understood as an increase in government spending or as a decline in, uh, in taxes on GDP. And so it's a big, big question for business cycle macro. Uh, there's kind of two strands of the literature that study uh, this question. One is a positive strand that thinks about predicting the effect of, of changing in, of fiscal expansions in either good times or in bad times, like, uh, and especially renewed interest uh, right now during the COVID times. And also a normative strand that thinks about whether the government should spend more and uh, if so, at what times. Right? And so it's a huge literature uh, that's both an empirical and a theoretical literature. And what's really nice about that literature is that there's a, a, a lot of uh, debate back and forth between the theory and the empirics. All right, so the theory generates a certain set of testable predictions. And then we have a bunch of empirical results uh, from the work of Valerie Ramey that Kurt Seitz and many others. Um, that go back and inform the theory. Right? And so the paper is building on new theoretical advances in the field, uh, so-called Hank models, uh, and is proposing a set of uh, new testable predictions. Uh, it was one of the first papers to focus specifically on fiscal policy, which is an extremely natural application of this Hank framework. Um, so the paper is somewhat controversially titled The Fiscal Multiplier, and obviously, uh, you know, there is a question of what the fiscal multiplier is uh, from Theoretical uh, analysis, you know, dating back way before the paper, we know there is not one fiscal multiplier. There's clearly a, a bunch of numbers. You know, I like to think of it as a set of partial derivatives. Uh, so, you, so models tend to give us the response of output at any date t in response to changes in government spending at any other date s. Um, and uh, not only that, but this is a derivative that's taken us at a certain point in the state space in 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 Hank models. Um, and so, what that says is. Uh, we have m all these many multipliers, one for each pair, so it's an infinite dimensional matrix, and on top of that, it depends on the state, right? Um, so now, of course, we want to reduce dimensionality to be able to speak to the data, so we'll tend to summarize the path of government spending with some assumption on what the process for government spending here uh, is. So in the paper, it's, uh, it's an R1 process, um, and then we can focus on uh, the, 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 the path of output that follows from an increase in government spending, and in the paper, uh, as is natural from uh, the empirical literature, they focus on the impact multiplier as well as the cumulative multiplier. Um, and we can connect that to regressions. Okay, so the other thing, as I said, is it, and so what, what, is, what the state includes is model parameters and policy. Uh, so there is things that we already know from previous work, like factors affecting labor supply, say the first year uh, substitution. Um, which, uh, which is something that we know from neoclassical models really influences the multiplier. Uh, there's monetary policy in there. Um, and that's something we know from the new Keynesian model is extremely important to understand the fiscal multiplier. And there's, there's things that more recent literature has explored, uh, in particular, equilibrium selection. Uh, so if monetary policy is not sufficiently responsive, we'll need to know what selection of equilibrium is. Um, when the model is non recogen we know this from, say, the, the work in Tank uh, that preceded Hank. Um, we know that how the government adjusts the budget is going to be important for the multiplier. And then something that's specific to Hank is we know a priori the state of the economy, things like NPCs, the wealth distribution at a point in time, uh, will potentially influence the multiplier. And so the way I see the contribution of this paper is really in three steps. So the first one, which is new relative to last time I discussed this paper, is there is a way of getting at the monetary policy response uh, with a new method uh, using these Remy uh, Zuberi uh, shocks um, to, to extract the monetary policy response. And I think that's one very nice contribution. It sort of, it, it says on average, this is what we'd expect the monetary response to a fiscal shock to be. And we'll feed that through the model. So that's the first contribution. The second one is 
it uses a particular uh, equilibrium selection, and that's going to deal with point C here, uh, which we know is, is something that's important. Um, so those are two kind of uh, secondary contributions of the paper. I think the main contribution is the quantification, a quantitative evaluation of the importance of these two specific hang factors, how the government adjusts the budget, uh, and what the state of the economy is to the fiscal multiplier. Okay, so in the rest of the discussion, I'm going to be talking about the assumptions um, and, uh, and provide some uh, uh, advice along the way. Okay, so, um, so this is a, a model that's a Hank model that features one asset on the household side, rigid prices as in much of the literature, and rigid wages, which was newer to the paper when it was introduced uh, a couple of years ago. It's kind of grow, rapidly growing as a, a tip, typical assumption in these models. And then there's capital investment with quadratic adjustment costs. Right? And one of the key benefits of using a hang framework is that you can have a model that matches both some of the macro moments, but also the micro moments. And in particular, the wealth distribution and the empirical evidence on MPCs. Right? So I'm gonna provide some advice to improve the plausibility of the quantitative framework. So the first thing is I wanna praise the authors for using the sticky wage assumption. Right? So much of the previous work uh, hang literature had assumed flexible wages, uh, but then we have two big challenges, I think, for that, for that literature with flexible wages. The first one is the paper by Toby, um, the, the BHKO critique uh, that pointed out that uh, in those models, there's kind of cyclical profits that, that has enormous redistributive effects. It can make labor move the wrong way and so on and so forth. So that was like one big critique that moved the literature away from this. The other one is a paper I wrote with Matt Rogley and Ben Sebaldowski. Uh, that, that argues there's a trilemma for these models. It's basically impossible if you're in the class of flexible wage models to simultaneously match high MPCs as we see in the data, low marginal propensities to earn that we see in the data, and reasonable fiscal multipliers. There is no specification of, say, the preference function, things like complementarities uh, that might uh, simultaneously deliver all three. Right? And so in response to this, I think the literature has moved to sticky wages. And so this paper uh, does this. I think it's really nice. So the idea is to move households off their labor supply curves. For this, you need a rationing assumption uh, for increases in labor demand. And so in the paper, this rationing assumption is an equal, equal incidence assumption. Um, so this is the post-tax income uh, uh, that's, that households receive. So there's a certain lump sum transfer, and then there is um, there's their wages. And, and so what you see is an increase in labor demand H pushes up and down the, the, the wage component um, in proportion for everybody. Now, that's not especially realistic an assumption. I think it's a convenient assumption, but in order to do a, a plausible quantitative evaluation, it would be interesting to consider relaxing this. And it, we know that it's, it's possible to do, and so I, I think that, that, that would be an interesting uh, extension of the paper. Now, the second thing I said is it, it, it's great for, uh, uh, to have a hand framework uh, because you can match the micro moments. And so the paper claims that it matches two things. It matches a, a, a W over Y ratio that's large, uh, about five, which is the current US economy, as well as the wealth distribution, simultaneously with an annual MPC of about 0.4. Um, so that's great. That's exactly what we want our Hank models to, be, to do. Now it's also very difficult to do. And it's well known in the Hank literature that this is very difficult. So the standard in the literature, if you want to do this, is to have a two asset model. Uh, here, the paper uses a one asset model, uh, which is more tractable, um, but uh, uses this feature of beta heterogeneity. I actually think this might be a good alternative uh, for the Hank literature going forward, but there's been a lot of criticisms of beta heterogeneity out there. And so one of the things that I think would be nice is uh, for the authors to also report the wealth distribution. So not just kind of say they match certain moments, but actually report the full wealth distribution because beta heterogeneity tends to create these different groups of people, some of which hang out really close to the constraint and some others uh, uh, far away. And I think that would be nice to, to directly see. The other thing is, so the authors are targeting this uh, annual MPC number. Uh, we know from uh, the paper I have with Matt Rodley and Ludwig Straub on the intertemporal Keynesian cost that the key target for these Hank fiscal policy models is what we call intertemporal MPCs. So not just the impact effect, but the path. And so the authors are plotting the path here uh, of intertemporal MPCs. And one thing that's pretty uh, special to Hank models is that the decay in the path of spending after a receipt of spending is not exponential. Uh, it's actually faster than exponential. And so when that's the case, the formula that the authors are using, which is this formula, this annualization formula, actually does not apply. And so it's actually better if you want to know the annual MPC just to sum up the spending responses for the first four quarters, 
Um, and when I did this, just eyeballing it, it looks more like a 0.28 annually. So it looks like the MPCs are a little bit on the low end um, of the literature range. And so another um, thing that I'd be interested in, uh, I think for the literature would be to see if you can push up the MPCs uh, to, to see how far uh, you can go. And so that probably will change some of the quantitative results, make the consumption response stronger. Okay, so let me uh, now discuss the findings of the paper. So there's three, four main findings in the paper that I see. Uh, the first one is that the fiscal multiplier is less than one uh, if, def, uh, if uh, spending is financed uh, with lump sum taxes, and it's greater than one if it's deficit finance. The second is that deficit financing uh, crowds out capital investment. So investment falls when there's deficit financing. Um, the third is that there is limited state dependence in the model. Uh, this is what uh, the authors call the liquidity trap experiment. Uh, and the fourth one is that the paradox of flexibility disappears. So uh, Kurt covers all of this. I'm just gonna provide some comments on each of those uh, results. Right. So the first one is, there's from my uh, uh, intertemporal occasion cross paper, there's a proposition out there that I think is really useful to structure what we'd expect to see in a Hank model. Uh, so it's under a set of, set of assumptions. So if you assume that real interest rates are held constant by monetary policy, assume away capital, and then assume that uh, there's contemporary near taxation with a certain tax scheme, such that all net of tax incomes are affected in proportion, then the fiscal multiplier is one at every date. That is the impact multiplier is one, also the cumulative multiplier is one. Uh, what it is for this matrix that I talked about earlier is when government spending increases today, it just increases output today and that's it. In other words, consumption is, all, is completely fixed. So that's a natural benchmark because it, it shows you for this particular set of assumptions, heterogeneity is completely neutral for the effects of fiscal policy. We get the standard uh, representative agent result. So why is that? Well, that's because government spending is increasing pre-tax incomes, right? But at the same time, it's increasing taxes and it increases taxes in the same way with the same incidence as that of pre-tax incomes. And so it reduces post-tax incomes but under this particular distributional uh, assumption, it, it, it reduces it exactly by the same amount for everyone. Right? So the, by the same amount that their income is increasing. And so the effects cancel out exactly. Since on top of that, the real interest rate is unchanged, incomes are unchanged, so consumption is unchanged, and so consumption does not move at all. Right? So this is actually reminiscent of an old result, the balanced budget multiplier result from the 40s, 1940s, uh, which, uh, where people pointed out that this could happen. And, and this is something that we can see in our Hank models. Now here, there's two sets of results on what happens uh, when uh, the, the, the government increases spending. One is if it's tax finance, the fiscal multiplier is less than one. But as Kurt pointed out, um, and I think would be nice to clarify even further relative to this benchmark, this is because the government's adjusting lump sum taxes. In other words, it doesn't adjust the proportional tax. Right? So if you start from my benchmark where the multiplier is one, then you can understand what's going on here by combining this with a reduction uh, the proportional tax that's uh, f paid for by a reduction in transfers. And those are lump sum transfers. So it's uh, a redistribution from low income agents to high income agents that we know is contractionary. And, and so that's kind of a simple way of understanding what's going on relative to the one. Why is it lower than one? Now, the other result is that fiscal multiplier is greater than one if instead there's deficit financing. And here that's because of non recardian So I was very clear about that in the presentation. Uh, so the way to understand it's relative to the one is you combine the effect with an increase in transfers today that you um, finance by a reduction in future transfers. And so you combine a one with a transfer multiplier. You're doing a, a transfer today that you'll, uh, you'll offset later. And so that should be expansionary. So that's explaining the, the one. And so I, I think that our balanced budget multiplier result is very useful to understand what's going on. And it would be nice to, uh, to mention that in the paper. The second result is on crowding out, right? So here it looks like a deficit financing crowds out investment. Um, and what I want to point out here is that this is entirely due to the specification of monetary policy. Uh, so there's a nice formula for a paper I have with Matt um, that uh, tells you when you have quadratic adjustments cost as in the paper, you can qu quantify the, the aggregate investment dynamics uh, by uh, using this equation that tells you what happens to investment after a shock? Uh, well, that entirely depends on what happens to future marginal products of capital and future user cost of capital, the, the R. Right? And so everything works either through changes in MPKs or future R. What happens here is that government spending is pushing up future employment and therefore future MPK. So that's a crowding in effect. That's the effect of raising the marginal product of capital on desired investment. 
Now, why could you get crowding out? Why is there crowding out? I think in the paper is because real interest rates are going up. Right? Now, that's a very nice and testable mechanism. It just says crowd out if and only if real interest rates go up. That's something you can test, right? And so, one, as I said, one of the things that's really nice about the paper is they, they look at the monetary policy response um, uh, or the, the, the response of nominal interest rates after government spending shock. So I think it would be great to look at real interest rates and then to split that depending on whether the, the spending was deficit finance versus uh, tax finance uh, so that we can see if there is in fact more increases in real interest rates after, a deficit, after deficit financing. The third result the paper has is on limited state dependence, right? So the, the abstract says the size of the multiplier is similar in the liquidity trap. And here, I think the language is a little bit misleading. Kurt was really clear about this in the talk, but this is more about the writing, right? So usually when we say the liquidity trap, we tend to mean in the literature, there's a change in monetary policy. For example, you enter a regime where there's a zero lower bound. Here, this is not what the authors do. The authors keep the monetary policy the same. In other words, no response of nominal interest rates. They just mean we've hit the economy with a bad shock and now we're recomputing the multiplier. So it's a state dependence result. I think that's completely fine. The, there is, um, you know, the language in the paper is, is quite clear about it, but I think the liquidity trap experiment is quite misleading. So I would not actually call this that. I would just say what happens in a recession right? and change the language. And then the suge suggestion of understanding why limit, there's so much limited uh, state dependence is I would actually show the wealth distribution on average, so in the steady state, and then, un then once you're um, already in that recession state. Right? So we can see whether the wealth distribution is significantly different because that's really what uh, we'd expect to drive a lot of state dependence. So I have no idea with the shock itself whether that's pushing enough people close to the constraint that I should expect to see a lot of state dependence. I think that would be interesting to elicit. Um, and let me uh, conclude, this is for all the results on the role of monetary policy in the paper. So all the results in the paper are critically driven by this, what I think is a little bit of a hidden assumption on monetary policy. So. The empirical evidence shows the nominal interest rate is constant. And so throughout the paper, the authors are going to, are going to assume that I is zero uh, as the specification of monetary policy. But the empirical evidence does not show that the nominal bond level is constant in the long run. And that's what the paper is assuming, that the nominal bond level is constant. Now, in the paper, in the model, uh, this assumption is equivalent to a price level targeting policy. And, and Kurt mentioned this, that the price level has to revert back to uh, the initial level in the long run. That's because bonds revert back to the level in the long run. And that's a key thing that, that we know with price level targeting, you can also overturn the paradox of flexibility. Right? So the paradox of flexibility in the new Keynesian literature is driven by an actual zero assumption on nominal interest rates, not a kind of hidden price level targeting assumption. Now, why is it, why I'm saying it's hidden that's because nominal interest rates do not move, but it is the case that the, the Hank model is similar to the representative agent model with bonds in the utility, which modifies a little bit the Euler equation in the following way. So, you know, at the margin now, agents, when they save, they also get a little kick out of having, uh, holding the, the real uh, value of bonds, right? And so that shows up in the Euler equation symmetrically to a, a nominal interest rate. So if you have a constant long run level of nominal bonds and the price level goes up, that's lowering the real value of assets. It makes agents want to save more. So it's the same thing as an increase in nominal interest rates, right? And so, and it's, it's really symmetric to just uh, the nominal interest rate increasing in proportion to the, to the level of prices, right? So that's why I'm saying it's, it's just exactly the same as price level targeting. Right? Um, so what I think would be important here is to, um, is, is two things, okay? So this, there's, it's a separate equilibrium selection. We could study that equilibrium selection in a representative agent model. Right? Um, so I would like the authors to separate the conclusion from this particular policy rule from those that are really special to Hank. And for that, I think it's more natural to assume long-run fiscal policy said something like the real level of bonds or the bond to GDP ratio, and then remapping all the results with this more standard equilibrium selection. Now, I understand that some of this might create paradoxes, and I think that's okay. That, that would just say there's two contributions to the paper, two separate contributions. One is pointing out what's separate to, specific to Hank, and one is what's pointing out what's specific to this equilibrium selection rule. And then the others are really attached to the selection rule. I think that's fine, but then they should really test this, this prediction of the model, this prediction that the price level mean reverts. Right? And so again, you can look at the Remy Zuberi data 
and see how close you are to that. And my suspicion is we won't see that much in reverse in reverse level typically. Uh, you know, an increasing intuition doesn't kind of revert back automatically. Now, of course, that might change with the new policy, monetary policy framework that uh, a bunch of countries are putting in place. Okay, and so the final thing that I want to say is given this large assumed price and rigidities plus DLB plus this selection, in many experiments, the real interest rate is essentially constant. And I actually think that this is great. Uh, this is exactly what we want for these models which is these models are, are calibrated to match the responsiveness of consumption to incomes, but they're not calibrated to match the consumption, uh, the response of consumption to real interest rates. So as much as we can have a real interest rate doesn't move, that doesn't move too much, that actually uh, relies on the part of the model that's uh, uh, the one that we have the most confidence in. Okay, so just uh, to conclude, it's a very nice and ambitious paper. It's uh, the first fiscal policy contribution to Hank. It's already been quite influential. I think there's still some aspects of calibration and narration that can be improved. Um, and I have my bigger problems on the monetary specification that I think is not really plausible or canonical. And so I'd like the authors to consider more standard alternatives or comparative pity. Um, thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Adrian, uh, for a great discussion, uh, I think. I'm um, I have a lot of background, uh, background uh, noise right now. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I would let, we are running late on time, but let us Kurt respond first and then we'll open up to questions, perhaps after closing the formal seminar because we're running a bit late. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief since we're running late. No, I think I think I'll be brief. Uh, I think they they were very useful. I mean, I think you know in particular like the the, the one about equal incidence uh, and and putting that in might be particularly important for thinking about you know kind of what I put it out of like the the state dependence experiment. I mean, there was no force to cause there to be any dis like distributional impact. So obviously something thinking about unequal incidence could potentially give more kick because then, you know, you're kind of inducing more redistribution across agents that then could be corrected. Um, and just quickly, like, yeah, in terms of wealth distribution, we match the wealth distribution taking out home equity, uh, which is maybe you like or you don't like, but we don't think this is a good model of houses, so we took them out. Um, but so again, it's, we're kind of matching a restricted wealth distribution there. Um, I agree with you about the IMPCs that that makes sense and I, you're right the kind of kind of the comparing to uh, your your benchmark with the constant straight and the proportional uh, incomes is, is a nice thing to do uh, and again kind of separating out the you know the effects of kind of the what's coming from the fiscal policy versus what's coming from the monetary policy and that selection is, is a nice thing to, to clear up I, I will say in the ratings of Barry with this I, I don't know if we're it, we may be, and not even be super clear on it in the paper but it's the the debt increases permanently if you kind of feed through the Ray Musuberry uh, fiscal policy rule. So we in our experiment, the long run price level actually permanently increases in that experiment to match uh, their their numbers. So, but we should we should do the price level. I mean, we, we can run the price level on that uh, to see how how it changes. But that yeah, there you know if you feed in the path of of there's positive deficits and the deficits go to zero, which but the the debt, I mean, the deficits never go negative. So clearly like the, the debt just permanently increases um, from, from what they've done. So that's what we, we feed in. Um, so at least in the US, it looks like these spending events are never paid back. So they're more like the, the controversial picture I showed at the end, uh, but we should, we should also show the, the price level effect just to be, to be consistent with that. Um, so yeah, but otherwise I think they're all great comments and thanks a lot for the nice discussion. Uh, thanks very much. At this point, I would like to thank both of you um, for a great talk and a great discussion, because uh, I'm also seeing that some people are, are leaving. So let me thank you again um, for, for uh, a very interesting, uh, interesting lecture and discussion. I would just keep uh, talking to you and allow now the audience to open mics. We're not bound by the time restriction going to 5.30. Science should uh, be above so those things. So we just keep talking um, as long as, as, as Kurt and Adrian have time and as long as there's interest from the audience. Um, so now, um, please, if you have a question, I think you could, should now be able to just unmute yourself and ask that question 
to paradigm. Well, until the audience gets ready, I have a question that I'd like to ask that links to both Kurt's, um, first of all, to the notion that there's not just one multiplier and to the role of lump sum taxes, which are assumed to uh, the, the, the thing that adjusts the entry school policy. Um, my colleague, Axel Ferrier, who unfortunately can't be here today, she has a paper where she argues that the fiscal expansions in the US after the Second World War were really, really completely dependent on whether they were financed by proportional or by progressive taxes. So is that true in your model also, Kurt? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the point that Adrian, you know, made when he was comparing it, you know, like the, the benchmark that they have is of the, you know, where everyone's going to lose the same. Now we, we've taken this particularly regressive form of taxation. Obviously, if you had a, you know, a more, pro, you know, if you could do the flip side where you make it progressive, where you, you know, you could just increase the linear tax or you could, you know, you could put in a nonlinear tax function, increase the, uh, the regressivity, and then that would make it more expansionary. So, you know, anything through which the, the fiscal policy becomes more progressive, you're going to get bigger, uh, bigger multipliers. So that's, that's again, something that you, you could also put in as a kind of a, you know, the nice thing about the model is you can do, you know, an infinite number of things, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, page limits are getting tightened, so we can only do uh, a finite number in, in our experiment, but that, that certainly uh, is, is important. And I mean, we could look at even in, uh, we could feed in the time series of like progressive taxes to the Ramey zoo barrier to even see like what is actually the empirically right one because we just feed in like tax revenue, uh, but that's that's exactly right. Thank you. I think there was a question from the audience. Yes. So well, there's a chat question, but is there? Or you meant another question. You're muted, so I can't hear what you're saying. I, I can. I, I, I read the question. I was, I was doing well so far on my unmute. Those who have been in talks with me know that I don't, I'm not very good at that. Um, so, Craig, could you elaborate on the concept of price level determinacy? As I understand the paper, steady state price level is just a normalization. So what exactly does price level determinacy mean? No, so this, this gets back to Sergeant Wallace, 75. Uh, so that, you know, when you have, typically you have inflation determinacy, but you don't have a determinacy of the, the price level. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, here, if, if you fix a level of nominal bonds, uh, then it's not clear, you know, you can't just normalize the, the price level to be one, uh, because you have to clear the asset market. Uh, so, you know, in the representative agent model, you have this issue that when you have a Ricardian budget, uh, you know, Ricardian now meaning that the government budget holds for price levels is that you lose an equation. Now with the, with incomplete markets, uh, you have a non-trivial asset supply curve from the households, you know, with, with complete markets, it's vertical at beta equals one over R. Uh, but here, here, you know, if you think about kind of the Huggett model um, for, for bonds, if you have some nominal level of bonds, as the real interest rate moves, the amount of savings that people want to make will change. Uh, and so then the price level, if you kind of if you fix kind of the, the long run inflation and the nominal rate, that pins down the real rate. So the price level would have to adjust such that the real level of bonds would clear the asset market. Um, and so that's, that's essentially what we're doing is that, you know, you're clearing, you know, the, the price level, given a nominal level of, of the quantity, the price level just to, to clear the, the real side. Thank you, Carl. That was a question from Philip, by the way. Um, are there any further questions? You can also just unmute yourself and uh, talk if you like. All right, here. Silence. So that takes me there. There's one by Alkis Blanes. Oh, in the Q&A, which I see. So Alkis asks, how does your experiment relate to the theory on, de on indebted demand? by Mian, Straub, and Sufi. So I, I would say that, you know, one of the, the big differences in kind of the, the treatment of debt is, you know, here we're taking everything to be nominal and there's, there's things, things would be real. Um, and so, you know, here you, you'd have kind of a different role potentially for inflation in affecting, you know, if you have nominal debt, uh, the, like fix, if you imagine fixed rate mortgages can, for the U.S. case, then you're here you could get a lot more bang for your buck with uh, with inflation because kind of pushing 
you know, pushing up the price level, you actually would reduce, you know, you'd reduce the debt of those people and that would push up demand. So, um, you know, here we, we we're offering maybe potentially a different setup if you have uh, nominally specified kind of assets and liabilities as opposed to, to real. Obviously, you know, we know the truth is somewhere in between, you know, from, from Adrian's paper in AER, obviously, you know, the elasticity to net nominal positions, like if everything's fully nominal, is just crazy. Um, but, you know, we, we have kind of right now one extreme of fully nominal, they have another extreme where everything's fully real. And so probably the truth lies somewhere in between uh, the two. Thank you, Carol. Um, any further questions? Either in the queue, in the question and answer panel or in the chat or just talk ahead, trying to keep track of both. If that's not the okay, case, then let me again thank Kurt and Adrian, and we'll conclude the seminar with this. And um, let's give both of them a virtual applause, which I'm not even sure I can do now, um, but I'll just give them a real applause. Thanks very much to both of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.